Hi everybody and welcome to the Lionel 2018 Volume 2 Catalog. You found one of the first big surprises from the new edition. This is our new Vision Line locomotive delivering in the first half of 2019. Now normally at Lionel we do one Vision Line locomotive about every other year, but this year we got some double vision and decided that for the first time we would bring back a, a re-hit of a previous locomotive that was offered in the Vision series but one which had only been done in a very limited number of paint schemes and road numbers, and there was still a lot of uh, good locomotives available to do in this and, and a lot of demand out there for them. So we think you're going to be very happy with these new locomotives uh, when you see them and, and get them in your hands. As you can see in these pages, uh, there are lots of new options to, to choose from. Uh, so let's take a few minutes and talk a little bit about the Union Pacific's Challengers and what makes them so special and vision-worthy, uh, and look at their history for a little bit. Uh, the locomotives that we're most familiar with as challengers, uh, and most people think of when you hear the term challenger, uh, are the locomotives of the class that you see here in the, in the model. And these were actually the second to last group of challengers delivered to the Union Pacific. Uh, but their, their history and the story of this locomotive type goes back actually about uh, 10 to 15 years earlier uh, with their development uh, earlier on in the 1930s uh, as the Union Pacific sought to find new locomotives that were uh, powerful, but also faster and much more efficient than what they had previously. Like most of Union Pacific's development and some of the big monster locomotives that had come before, the Union Pacific was faced with some very steep mountain grades uh, in the Wasatch Mountains and was looking for power that could handle uh, tonnage up these grades unassisted, but also specifically at higher speeds. So they had articulated locomotives and big massive locomotives that could pull heavy trains, but they had to go very slow to do it. And what they wanted was a locomotive that could still handle the hill, but handle it at a much faster pace so that they could keep faster uh, freight schedules. Also, this development was happening in the 1930s when every railroad was very cost conscious and looking for ways to save money any way they could. So eliminating a second locomotive was one big way to do that. It was one less locomotive to service, fuel, maintain, and put a crew on. Uh, but also uh, getting more efficiency out of each locomotive on the line. So making them a more reliable machine to cut down on shop costs, fuel costs, uh, and improve their utilization out on the railroad. Always a, a big challenge with, with any steam locomotive. So in the mid-1930s, the Union Pacific's development team combined with the development team at ALCO, uh, the American Locomotive Company, which was the primary supplier of locomotives for Union Pacific, began working on a new design. Uh, they had already tried some big locomotives in the past, including most famously their, their 9000 series, the Union Pacific Type, uh, which was a massive 412-2, uh, the biggest rigid frame locomotive uh, that had been built. And so the Union Pacific had figured they'd already gotten as much as they could out of a, a single drive engine like that and began to look towards an articulated locomotive. Not only would this give the opportunity to expand the size of the engine, but the change in the hinged frame meant that they would handle curves much more easily with less wear on the rails and so forth. So there was a lot of, a lot of advantage in that. Union Pacific and ALCO combined on the delivery of the first 15 locomotives, uh, and the Northern Pacific actually also took uh, an order of, of new Challenger types at that time. And then these were tested uh, for about a year from 1936 on their delivery uh, until the second order was placed in 1937. And that order included uh, another round of locomotives that had been Union Pacificized, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, after getting them on the property, the team had more of a chance to impart their own design wishes on the locomotive, see what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and make changes to make the, the second group of locomotives a little bit more uh, like what the Union Pacific expected. Uh, these engines were used in both freight and passenger service, and uh, could be seen uh, all over the, well, not all over the Union Pacific system, but in a, in a, a fairly wide uh, stretch of areas. They weren't confined to the big hills like some of the other locomotives had been. The, the name Challenger, by the way, comes out of the early tests uh, for these locomotives. Uh, when the, the team was debating on how to break in the new engines and test their, their, their metal, uh, the decision was made to pull a train, uh, one train in one direction, then run light uh, to Green River and run back with a second train all in one turn. And the mechanical officer said, well, that would certainly be a challenge to any locomotive, uh, to which they said, well, let's call them Challengers then. And the name stuck. It also tied in very nicely with uh, a name train on the railroad at the time, the Challenger, which was one of the Union Pacific's premier passenger trains, uh, and a train which the Challengers would be assigned to re repeatedly. 
Um, and then also uh, a name later on given to their overnight fast freight service. So the Union Pacific got a lot of marketing use out of the, the Challenger name. But every railroad that rostered 4664s, uh, for the most part, did call them Challengers. Uh, fast forward to the, the war years during World War II, and the Union Pacific is in need of more power to handle the wartime traffic. And they go back to Alco again for another order of Challengers. And this is when things change again. So a lot of people call those first batches of Challengers sort of the early Challengers or the little Challengers. And then during the war years, you get the, the later or the more modern or, or larger challengers, which what most people are familiar with thanks to uh, the two surviving examples. The, uh, there are, are several, there are actually three orders placed which look very similar uh, starting in 1942 uh, for these locomotives. The ones that we've modeled come from a reorder in 1943, which also included six locomotives that were diverted to the Rio Grande during the war years uh, and then later sent to the Clinchfield. These locomotives, in many ways, look like their, their larger uh, sisters, the big boy. Um, so that, uh, and that, that's not by accident. The, the Challenger was actually a slightly scaled down version of the big boy. They had taken a lot of the lessons that the Union Pacific learned on the construction of the big boys, as well as the FEF classes of Northerns, and combined them into a new Challenger type, uh, which was a little bit larger, a lot more efficient, a lot more powerful than the, the earlier locomotives. As you, so as you look at the locomotive, you'll see a lot of similar features, including the, the larger double stack, the uh, sand dome positioning, the front end arrangement, and so forth, uh, even the cab style and type, uh, and similarities in the tenders, too, that sh share a common bond with uh, the other late motive power on the Union Pacific. From their introduction until their retirement in the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, these locomotives went through, again, a number of small changes most of which were internal or not very visible on, on the ex outside uh, from, a, from a modeling standpoint. But two of the bigger changes uh, came with the addition of smoke lifters on, on some units, mainly the oil burners, and the conversion uh, to oil burning, mostly used in, in, on passenger service engines, but also used in different areas of the railroad, including uh, out of Los Angeles, up Cajon Pass, and uh, on some of the northern areas uh, in Oregon and up towards Seattle. That made, of course, a change in the, in the tender and the firebox, and then uh, the smoke lifters on the engine, which helped pull the smoke up over the cab as they were moving at speeds so that it improved visibility for the crew. We'll be incorporating all of those detail changes on our new run of Challenger locomotives. Ultimately, the locomotives, as efficient and as powerful and as good as they were, succumbed to the diesels in the 1950s. Uh, retirements began in 1959, and by 1961, all but two Challengers had gone to the scrapyard. Uh, those two survivors, number 3977, uh, which is now in static display, and 3985, uh, which was returned to the Union Pacific Steam Program and run for many years and is, at the time of this filming, uh, being rebuilt for uh, operation and excursion use yet again, uh, sort of carry that, carry that mantle forward uh, for this locomotive type and have made them an enduring favorite for, for fans worldwide. So with that background in mind, let's take a quick look at the new Vision Line Challenger. What you're seeing in front of me here is actually our engineering sample, which we've cobbled together from uh, bits and pieces of the old Challenger that we've done. Uh, so there will be some detail changes and, uh, and, and paint differences and so forth between what you're seeing here in front of me and what you'll ultimately have delivered. Uh, I invite you to look through the pages of the catalog as well to see all the different uh, paint schemes that we'll be offering uh, and, and to review the features uh, that we have. But to take a quick look at what we've, we've got here, there are multiple smoke units in this locomotive, like we do with every Vision Line engine. Uh, stereo sound, like we've, we've been doing in, in engines again. So you have a pair of speakers in the tender, another speaker up here in the boiler of the locomotive. So you get great sounds on the chuff. You get a beautiful whistle sound. Uh, this will have the same whistle as our Vision Line Big Boy of 2014, which uh, a lot of people, despite all the other great features on a lot of people still go to say the whistle, the sound of the whistle is the best thing in the engine. So you'll get that same wonderful sound out, out of this locomotive. Other sounds will actually sort of come in or out from various parts of the locomotive depending on what would be appropriate. So you'll, you'll have more localized sound with the uh, play off of the, the multiple speakers as well. There'll be a smoke unit for the stack, smoke unit for the whistle, and then, as we did on the first round, a smoke unit which runs the dynamo, or the, the generator, which provided electricity for your lighting functions and so forth, as well as one of the injectors on the locomotive. Now, this is a smoke feature that's designed to be less prominent 
than, say, your stack or your whistle smoke where you get a giant plume of, of steam uh, in operation. Uh, but these are devices on the locomotive that were steam driven and, and often pretty much in constant use. So you would see wisps of steam coming out of the dynamo or out of the injector when they were in use. Now, most steam locomotives, and the Challenger was no exception, had a pair of injectors. And each injector was designed uh, so that it would be able to keep the boiler full of water, uh, pulling the water from the tender into the, into the boiler. Uh, under short bursts for really heavy use, climbing a grade at full speed with a heavy tonnage, for example, um, the engineers sometimes would double gun uh, the locomotive, and the engineer and fireman each would, would fire off the injectors, so you had two injectors running. But really, for the most part, you only saw one injector uh, running. That was normal practice uh, for the locomotive. So you'll get a, a, a nice wisp of steam here out of the generator, and you'll also get a wisp of steam out of the side of the cab, underneath the cab on the engineer side. There's another output uh, for, for a steam effect there with these locomotives. One of the changes and improvements that we'll be making for this round of challengers over the previous edition, in addition to be able to toggle all of these effects on or off, of course, the generator or dynamo effect will come on when you turn on the headlight, and then you'll hear the sound of the dynamo winding up as the headlight uh, come on. So you'll be able to activate that effect uh, that way, and as long as the lights stay on, of course, your dynamo effect will stay on as well. Another improvement that we'll be making uh, in this round of locomotives uh, will be to the addition of a kinematic drawbar between the locomotive and tender. This is the drawbar that expands into curves so that you'll keep a nice close tender coupling uh, on straightaways. We're also, an uh, improvement over the additional run, we'll have a wireless tether uh, between the locomotive and tender. Now in the first round of vision locomotives, you had the wireless connection, but you also still had two speaker wires to, to plug in. Well, we've eliminated the need for, for those additional wires to plug in uh, between the locomotive and tender. And of course, since we've, we've moved into the, uh, the modern era, uh, the new round of challengers are going to include all of our latest legacy electronics, which are a vast improvement over the modular boards that were used in the first round. So this will have, the, of course, the standard now RCMCC board on board, as well as our new Bluetooth control module. So in addition to being able to run this conventionally or with legacy or TMCC control, you can download the free Lion Chief app or pick up one of our universal remotes and run the locomotive wirelessly and very simply with those devices. Uh, you won't have full features using the Bluetooth mode uh, because we don't have the functionality built in uh, for all the different smoke features, for example, on that. But you will get uh, the majority of the, the features of the engine that people have come to expect and, and use the most in a very simple, very user-friendly uh, cab format or, or phone format that makes it a lot of fun. So, you don't have to get completely into the legacy system or buy an expensive command control system to enjoy most of what this engine has to offer and bring a full-size steam locomotive to your layout. Another change over the previous run was we'll be doing both oil and coal-fired fired versions with various detail changes. Uh, and I'll, be going, I'll go over those in, in just a second here. Um, and then also multiple additional add-on uh, products to go along with this on the pages to follow here in the catalog. But uh, don't turn the page just yet. Let's talk a little bit about some of the different locomotives that we'll be doing. So of course one of the things that we want to do on this, this round of locomotives is the 3985. How we did a vision engine of a Challenger and not doing 3985 was a big oversight, right? So we've corrected that oversight and you'll be able to get 3985 in full vision features. And it will be done as the excursion version with the oil-fired tender. We'll also do conventional uh, Union Pacific paint schemes in a variety of, uh, uh, of other configurations. So we have the 3981 as a coal burning locomotive in this traditional Union Pacific black paint with the coal fired tender. We have 3717 and the oil fired version, so black boiler, uh, oil tender, and the elephant ears on the smoke box. We have the 3977 uh, as it's re as it sits now in uh, Cody Park, in the Greyhound paint scheme, beautiful two-tone gray uh, with the oil, ta or, yeah, oil tank and elephant ears. And then also for folks looking for something a little different and, and very special and unique, we have the 3975, which was will be modeled as it was in a, in a short-lived test in 1948. This locomotive will be available exclusively through the LCCA, Lionel Collectors Club of America, order it through them directly. And what makes this engine a little bit unique, uh, it's in the Greyhound scheme, like the 3977. It has the oil burning tender and the elephant ears, 
It also has a single stack. So instead of the dual smoke stack like you see here on this locomotive, it has just a single stack. And this was a, a test done by the Union Pacific to test, uh, to test the differences in, in drafting and so forth. Clearly, uh, in their eyes, it was not successful and uh, not repeated. But uh, we do have the tooling for a single stack version. So we'll be doing that in Greyhound paint and sort of a neat little uh, chapter in the Union Pacific's Challenger history. We'll also be using that single stack version for our Clinchfield locomotive. After the Clinchfield got them from the Rio Grande, they actually, for, for whatever reason, went the other way with it and decided they would prefer a single stack. So they converted their locomotives over to a single stack. Speaking of the Rio Grande, we have two different versions of that locomotive available as well. One will be a prototypically correct version uh, with the Rio Grande speed lettering on the tender. And the second is a more of a what-if paint scheme based on their first round of challengers, which were delivered with a green boiler. So this will have the green boiler and the earlier Moffat tunnel route lettering on the tender. Uh, just something a little bit different, adds a nice uh, spice of color to the locomotive and uh, makes it a really attractive engine. Speaking of what if uh, color and colorful paint schemes, we did one for the Union Pacific as well. Uh, the Union Pacific experimented with just a couple of streamlined steam locomotives that were finished in a yellow and uh, a copperish uh, brown uh, color scheme for the 49er. And other passenger trains, we thought, well, what if they had applied the same paint techniques to a Challenger locomotive? What would that have looked like? So in the same vein as the, uh, or same spirit as the Daylight Cab Forwards and Milwaukee Road Hiawatha S3s and uh, New York Central Lightning Stripe uh, Niagara's, we bring you the 49er inspired Challenger on 3949. 3949. Uh, and what a colorful locomotive that is, as you uh, see here in the catalog should be a really popular uh, version. For those who want no paint at all, we also have an unpainted pilot model available. All of these locomotives will be billed to order, so don't delay. See your favorite Lionel dealer and place your order now so that you're guaranteed delivery when these come in 2019. The story of the Challengers doesn't end with the Challengers, so please continue to flip through the next couple of pages. You'll see we have some great aux new auxiliary water tanks, which come in paint schemes to match all of these different variations, and also have some wonderful new features uh, on board. These are the most elaborate uh, water tanks that we've done yet, and they will really enhance the operating uh, enjoyment you get out of these locomotives. Um, in addition to the uh, additional electrocoupler and so forth, these now are equipped with sounds. So you'll get rail sounds when in motion, you'll get uh, a special servicing sequence sound, for example, uh, when you bring the engine in to refill with water and, and, and coal and so forth. So there will be a lot new, more dialogue and, and fun features added into those engines to help enhance your, your play value of the locomotives. Last but not least, if you're buying a big engine, you need plenty of cars for it to pull. So we have Challenger boxcars and, and a Challenger caboose to recreate the fast freight service. And we have some additional add-on cars for our Union Pacific Challenger passenger train, as well as the recently delivered Union Pacific excursion 21-inch passenger cars, uh, which a lot of people have been clamoring for some more cars for their sets. So you'll see some expansion cars in there as well. So whether you want to run freight or passenger, we've got you covered here with the new Challenger. With that said, you've got a lot of catalog to cover. So you better get, get to flipping, and we'll see you down the road.